Neat. All right, uh, my name is Charlie Coster. Uh, I work for a company called Aventure. Uh, we're here in Omaha. We do startup work, contracting for commercial DoD. Uh, but today, I want to talk to you about flux and redux. Uh, these are uh, design patterns that I heard of when I started learning React. Um, and uh, it was really, it shouldn't be that hard of a, of a concept to, to grasp, but for me it was a little bit difficult, and so I had to read a lot of tutorials, watch a lot of talks. And so I put together some material that I thought would be just easier for someone else to learn. So we have some, uh, some pretty pictures, we've got some uh, live code, and we have some demos. Uh, and so hopefully uh, uh, this will be a good talk here. Uh, also keep in mind something that Nick just said. Uh, you don't have to be an expert, so just keep that in the front of your brain when you, when you listen to this talk. Uh, before I get into Flux, I want to talk about what Flux is not. Uh, Flux is not React.js. And you, hear, you usually hear Flux when you start learning React. Uh, and just going to kind of settle or just spell a myth that there is no dependency between React.js and Flux. Uh, Flux is a design pattern for managing state on the client, whereas React.js is concerned about uh, keeping the DOM in sync with the current state. So uh, it's typically viewed as the view layer in the typical you know, MVC frameworks, uh, and it does so by creating, you create declarative com components. Uh, and I mean component in the sense of an Angular directive or a custom element. Uh, and so here's an example uh, React component. I'm not going to go too deep into React just because you, can't, you guys can't hear to hear about Flux and Redux. Uh, but all of my code examples are in React. And aside from that, React is really easy to learn in my opinion. And so I'm just going to show you here's what React is and we will just we'll get through it together. Uh, this is how you create a React component. React.create class. Uh, this is a simple counter. All that's really required for a React component is a render method. Again, this is a declarative component. You return, uh, you return the, the DOM or the HTML that, uh, that represents this component, and React behind the scenes will take care of how to sync that up with the current state. So you see this is a simple counter. The counter starts at zero. Uh, you see that this is actually a JSX file. A JSX file allows you to intermix HTML and JavaScript uh, and to escape, to escape HTML land. You put little curly braces to display the count or call an on-click handler there. And just some other useful functions that you may see, uh, but I'm not going to dive too deep into. Uh, React has lots of optional uh, methods for the lifecycle. So when the component, before it first renders, after it first renders, before it's about to update, uh, after you remove it from the DOM, uh, should the component update, you can override this if you want to you know, uh, intelligently say, even though the state changed, I don't want to re-render anything. So uh, again, I'm not doing React justice, and I apologize for that, but uh, you should really look into it, and again, just a quick reminder, you don't have to use Flux with React, uh, you don't have to use React, React with Flux, but in today's examples, I'm going to, going to show that. And so, again, before I, I describe what Flux is, I want to describe the problem that Flux is trying to solve. And the problem it's trying to solve are issues that you see with MVC. This is typically what you think of when you see MVC, you have some view, uh, it, it displays data from a model. Uh, the user can interact with the UI and the view, which triggers some method on a controller, and the controller then updates the model, and it can also watch for changes on the model. Again, this is kind of dependent on whether you're using Angular or Backbone, Ember or Knockout, and so on. <coughs> Generally speaking, this is, this is typically what you think of with MVC. But it's a deceitful picture because it's not the entire picture. I mean, you have to get your data from somewhere. And so uh, you have to talk to a service, and the service talks to some endpoint, and when the data comes back, it updates the model. So a little bit more complicated, not much, still manageable, mm -hmm. uh, but still an incomplete picture because our applications don't just have one model view and controller, they have lots. So to take a quick example, here's a uh, screen cap I took from Facebook. By the way, if you're in the back and you can't read it, just wave and Sandy, you're assigned to that task. Uh, if you can't read it, let me know, okay? It's all pixelized anyway. Well, it's a Facebook view, so I'll just describe it. Uh, how about that? Uh, so like I said, if we scale up this MVC, uh, let's take, for example, a few components that are in this view. Uh, you see some profile cards on the left side there. Uh, a profile card in this, in this definition is something that displays a picture and has a click handler, handler that will take you to your profile page. 
Uh, that profile card is composed inside of another component. Let's say, let's call it a, a message component where it has the profile card and a message and a like button and a reply button. So uh, that controller deals with that functionality. And then all that is inside of, let's call it a thread component. So a thread component is composed of many uh, message components. So that's the example we're going to work with. As we see as it scales up, the examples I pointed out, there are three domains. There's a user, there's a message, and there's a thread. And so we have endpoints, services, and models for all three of those. And then you see we have our components. Now in the MVC diagram I showed the view and the controller as separate things. They're really so tightly coupled that they might as well be the same thing called a component. And so that's what I'm representing here is when I say component, profile card component for example, I mean the controller for that view and the view itself, the template. And we start drawing out some of the dependencies here. We see, okay, we've got some arrows going back and forth there because it has the controller and the view. Uh, so it's talking to the models, it's talking to the services, and you kind of see, okay, it's a small example and I can keep track of it in my head, but it's starting to get complicated. And what happens when we scale this up even more? So what else is there in that view? I see uh, an input form uh, or an input box for creating new messages. That is inside of another component, probably a form. I see a camera button. I see what they call a like sentence, which calculates how many people uh, have liked it and you click on it, it shows up some modal. And we display those dependencies and you know, right? Look at all these dependencies. You can't really keep track of what's going on. And so this is Flex, not Flex, Facebook realized this issue not with their, their thread view that you see up there, but with their chat messaging system. You may have seen this bug in recent years where you receive a new, let's say, private message, you get a little red indicator at the top, you click on it, read it, okay, it dismisses that indicator. Then you get, navigate to a new page, that thing comes back again, but you didn't receive a new message. They would constantly receive this bug, and when they diagnosed it, they figured out that it was because of uh, decentralized mutations uh, and cascading changes. And it's pretty obvious by looking at this picture uh, what we mean by that. And so some issues with MVC, uh, you have complexity caused by interdependencies. Again, cascading changes. When one thing changes, that causes something else to change, and may cause something else to change. It's actually you know, built into the, uh, the Angular framework. You can only do that 10 times before it, it barfs on you. Uh, decentralized mutations, you have some model, and anything can change it any way it likes, which is just a nightmare, uh, especially for you know, just trying to figure out what, what the application is doing. Other issues, uh, you know, race conditions, intertwined relationships. It's really hard to reproduce a bug, especially with cascading changes. And also, unless you're the person or people that have that actually wrote the code, uh, with medium-sized to very large-sized applications, it is very difficult uh, to, to go into the application and figure out what's going on. So the Facebook team saw a lot of these issues with their MVC implementation in Facebook itself, and they decided to create a design pattern called Flux. So that's what we're going to go over, and we're going to start simple, just like we did with MVC, and we're going to scale it up and see how it scales and see uh, how the problems are solved. So in Flex, you have something called a store. Uh, it's sort of analogous to a model in MVC, uh, except it's different in, in some unique ways. Uh, internally, it has some internal state, some internal variables that, rip that uh, are just with that store. Um, it exposes a getter so that the views can know what the current state is, but it doesn't expose any setters. Uh, the way you mutate that, that state within that store is by dispatching an action. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit, but the key point there, there is there's no setters, you just make <coughs> actions to mutate the state. And when something does mutate within that store, it emits an event telling the view, okay, something's updated, view if you care about this update, uh, call my getter and re-render yourself. And so that's what the view is responsible for. And then if the, the user, for example, clicks a button in the view, the view needs to dispatch an action in order to mutate some internal state. And so what the view will do is it'll ask the action creator to say, hey, create me an action and dispatch it for me so that I can mutate uh, some internal state within a store. And so that's what the action creator actually does. Uh, and that's all client side. If you want to hit the server, the action creator can also, uh, has a reference to your, your service layer, your API layer, and that will hit an endpoint and it can come back uh, and also update your store on a successful or an unsuccessful response. So we're going through it quite, kind of quickly and I'll go through a couple examples. So uh, I'm going to breeze through this, uh, but, and we'll go through it a few times just to help you understand. 
This is an example of a store. As I said, there's some internal state. We have var underscore messages. That is the internal state. We see a getter at the top there. And then we see uh, chat app dispatcher dot register. Uh, so what this is telling you is uh, the, the dispatcher knows about this store because the store registered itself with it and it passes itself a callback. So what the dispatcher will do, and can you read that, Sandy? You have to wave me down. He can't read it. Can't read it. Enhance. Enhance. How are we doing? Gooder? That's definitely better. All right. Um, uh oh, my mouse went down. Let me do this so that gravity doesn't affect that. All right, so like I said, the, the store will ask for a, will, will provide a callback uh, that will expect an action. And you see within this callback, all the, there's just a giant switch statement that says, ba based on the action type, I'm going to mutate my internal state depending on what the action is. And you'll see before each break statement here, uh, we emit a change. That's basically just we're firing an event saying, any views that cared about this change to my internal state, it's time for you to request or call my getter to update yourself. And so that was a store. Next up is the view. Enhance. And again, this is a React view. It doesn't have to be a React view. It could be an Angular, Backbone, Ember, whatever, pick your flavor. Uh, and you see here, uh, we have some of our lifecycle methods that will add a change listener or remove it based on, you know, if we're just adding or removing the DOM. The change listener is this on change. We'll see here at the bottom. So whenever this, the store does update, uh, we will say, okay, we're going to update our internal state of the component uh, with whatever data we get by calling our getter from the store and the re render function will automatically re-render in React's case because it knows to do that when you call set state. And the last example I'll show you is the action creator. Let's see if I can be very general. Oh, no. Hang on, I'm sorry. There we go, action creator. And so what the action creator is, again, it's called by the views. The view will call it, you know, action creator create message. Here's the text in the current thread ID uh, in this example. Uh, the action creator is really the API for your stores. And so it, it defines how you can interact with your stores in any way. As I said, stores don't have setters. This is how you interact with your stores. And so in this example, this is actually an optimistic update of creating a message. Uh, the action creator will call a dispatch on the dispatcher, passing it in an action. And here you see an action is nothing complicated. It's an object, and by convention, it has a type uh, and some payload. In this case, the payload is text and current thread ID. Uh, and then later, the action creator says, OK, API later, actually create the message. And then when it comes back successfully, it'll call dispatch as well. And so let's go through this example here. So this kind of this looks a little intimidating at first, but this is the exact same diagram I just showed you, except it's with the three domains we just talked about in the MBC example. We have our user message and thread domains, and so we have the respective number of stores, action creators, services, and endpoints in there. And you see our three components on the bottom right there: our thread view, message view, uh, and profile. I should call the component. So if we take a, an example, let's say the user interacts with the UI and they want to create a message. Well, that particular component, say uh, message action creator dot create message, here's your payload. That will do an optimistic message creation, so it'll dispatch an action. The dispatcher has all the stores registered with it, so invoke all the callbacks with that same action on all of them. And two of them will drop it because neither the user or the thread store care about created messages, but the message store does. So the message store will handle it and update its internal state, emit a change, uh, that'll tell the views. Uh, probably the message component specifically that something has changed and so to request that data and re-render any views that actually cared about that state updating. But that's not all. Uh, the action creator is not done yet. That was an optimistic update. The action creator still needs to actually update or create that message on the mm -hmm. server. And so it'll call create message on the service layer, hits the endpoint, bounces back, and on success, uh, it'll say, the API layer will say action creator, okay, here's a message created uh, action or create me a message created action. Go ahead and dispatch that for me. And you see this is looking familiar now. Go through the same circle and we call a render. Uh, and you notice here, Flux is called a unidirectional data flow or design pattern. Data is only flowing in one direction. 
So it's, and you see no arrow, arrows going the opposite direction. You don't get cascading changes. You don't get decentralized mutations where anything can jump into the internal store and change it however it wants. There's a defined way to update the store, and that's through an action creator. And so, okay, let's see how this scales up. Uh, I have, let's say, <coughs> six domains, and therefore the respective number of action creator services and endpoints. Um, we see each one of those is registered with the one dispatcher. We have several high-level views. Uh, let's say that first one is a sidebar. Uh, the second one is a, uh, a header panel, and the and the third one is the message content area. So this is maybe a very small web page. Uh, and some things to notice here is that initial layer, that purple layer. Hopefully, it's purple up there. That purple layer are what are called control views, controller views. Uh, and they will listen to the stores on behalf of all the views that are underneath of them. And I really should call them components because that's what they are. Uh, and so those stores will only talk to controller views. But all of those green components uh, that are nested under, you know, in, in this hierarchy of views, they all have a reference to the action creator. So one might be a form, might, one might be, uh, you know, your inbox or a like button. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the user interacts with any of those, it'll call the respective action on the respective action creator to dispatch an action. And so that's how it scales. And what this does is it turns your application into a state machine, which is really neat. Uh, and I call it a state machine because the, the data that's in your stores at any, point in nine, at any point in time is the state of your application. Uh, and the way you migrate from one state to the next state is by dispatching an action, uh, which makes it really simple and really testable. Notice I say that the state is based on what's in the store and not what's displayed in the view. Uh, we don't want the, the source of truth to be in your views. We want the source of truth to be in your store and the, the, the UI needs to update accordingly. So it's kind of an important distinction there. Uh, reproducing bugs, so this is really neat. Uh, well, I don't know if Facebook still does this, but what they used to do is when you first logged in, they would record the initial state of your application. Uh, it would probably be wise of them to also record the browser version and maybe the UI <coughs> version because the UI changes so often it would be nice to know that. And then you could, they could record every action that you ever did, serialize all of that, and you click the you know, report a bug or, or you know, send something to the developer saying something bad happened. It would serialize that data, send it to Facebook, some developer would load it up, check out that version of code, maybe fire up a VM that had that uh, browser version, and they can replay exactly what you were seeing because they had the, the initial state and all the actions with their payloads and they could reproduce that bug. And they should be able to reproduce that bug every time. Again, it, it depends on what kind of bug it is. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's like a CSS bug or something weird with a unique browser version, you know, that's kind of a one-off, but uh, it, it's really neat that you can replay actions like that. And if you can record states, the initial state, you can record every state. And so you get undo functionality for free, basically. You just wholesale replace out the stores with what the store was previously, one time ago, two times ago, or you could redo. Um, so it's a neat thing you can get for free there. Okay. Uh, everyone's tired of looking at slides, at least for now, because uh, we're going to have more to come here. But I want to show you uh, an example Flux application. So this is the this is the Flux chat example. Enhance, got it. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, better? Yes. All right. This is the Flux chat example that comes with the Flux implementation of its own design pattern. Um, so you can see here, I can say hi, test. Uh, so we've got a message view here. We've got an input box down here. We've got what looks like a thread view here and under under a thread count. And as I click here, you see all that's happening here is behind the scenes on click dispatch some action which updates the store, which he fires an event that tells the view to update. So that's all that we're seeing going on behind the scenes here. And just to glance at the code, what's going on here? Ah, I suppose I was supposed to go left. Uh, you see, this is what the, the application looks like. And none of us, most of us probably haven't seen this before, but it's actually kind of easy to navigate. You know, we have got our different... Yeah, I need to blow that up. Hands. Thank you, whoever said that. We've got our actions, we've got some components, uh, some React components, uh, we've got some stores. Uh, we pop up in one of these stores and we see, so this is a thread store, and you see some initialization, so there's some bootstrapping code. 
event handlers, some getters, and we see our giant switch statement. Not so giant in this case because it only handles two actions, uh, but not too hard to navigate the code. Now, the Flux developers were nice enough, I don't know if they did this on purpose, but you'll notice here when we refresh, you see uh, the last message was at 4JS. Yes, of course, I'll see you there. And that was the last message, to, message displayed there. I type a new message and it doesn't update. So they were nice enough to give us a bug to, to kind of play with. Uh, and because I'm, I'm going a little slow on time, I'm going to truncate this bit. Uh, but I'm just going to show you, or let me explain. There's only a few, maybe two possibilities of what's going on here, of why uh, this thread view is not actually updating with the last message. Uh, option one, it's not actually firing an event or not firing an action. Oh, we know that's probably not the case because the actual message view is updating. So uh, option two and probably the last action, the store responsible for this data isn't handling that action correctly. So let's investigate. Uh, as I said, this was the thread view. And so it makes sense to look at the thread store. So let's look at the thread store. And we see these are the actions that we're handling. We have click thread, so it has something to do with uh, maybe showing the, 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 that thread in the message section. And then we have receive raw messages. Uh, it's a little bit cryptic, but that's basically the, the bootstrap code. But nothing in here says uh, handle you know, new message. You know, update the last message of this thread with the, the, new, the last created message. And so I'm just going to cut to the chase, unfortunately, and show you the fix. is super simple here. Let me cut this. Thread. So it, it turns out it is missing an action. Let me fire this up. Refresh. Enhance. Let's hope this works. It does. So need to totally meet the bar. And that sounds great. You can see that it works. There's my hello world still back there. So that was relatively easy. I know I kind of cheated and said, hey, there's this file that has the fix in it, but I promise you it's really easy to understand uh, when you're troubleshooting a Flux application. All right, great. I'm going to get back here. Okay, so next up are some shortcomings, and shortcomings is kind of it's a strong word in this con context. Uh, what this slide should be called is some minor inconveniences that Flux has that makes it inconvenient for developer dev tools. Uh, that's a lot to fit in a slide title. So um, some Flux shortcomings is what you get, or some dev shortcomings. Uh, shortcoming number one, the store is composed of two things, data and the functions that act on that data. Uh, and so what that prevents you from doing is hot reloading your store. Well, actually, you can hot reload your store. You just lose all your data. And so if you're working on some bug or you're developing a new feature and it requires you to fill out some form or go through some workflow uh, or doing anything that manip manipulates state, uh, when you hot reload it, you're going to lose it. And so uh, that kind of sucks, right? I mean, it sucks for developers. Uh, next up, stores have mutable data. And you've heard me here. I've been kind of criticizing MVC for having decentralized mutations. And at least with Flux, we've centralized that to just the store remove the setters and require you to use actions, but we still have mutable data inside those stores. Uh, and you'll hear in the industry in blogs and, and conferences, <coughs> immutability is starting to become a, a popular topic and it's going to be useful here for undo and redo uh, because in order to keep track of your previous states, you have to take snapshots of it. You can't just keep the reference of the previous state because then when you update that reference, it's going to update you know, the thing that you're saving. Uh, you don't have any hooks for cross-cutting concerns, such as logging or error handling. So if you wanted to log every action, for example, to serialize it and send it to a developer to troubleshoot it, that's not really that easy to do in Flux. And then, as you probably saw, even though it was way zoomed in, as I scrolled through that store, there's a lot of boilerplate. Uh, and as uh, Dan Abramoff would say, he's the creator of Redux, uh, it's not just code boilerplate, there's conceptual boilerplate. And so let's take a look at that right now. So I'm going to pop open an example store here. I will enhance. And how are we looking, Sandy? Looking good. All right. Uh, 
So here's an example store. This is everyone or everyone is probably familiar with to do MVC. It's a MVC application written about every framework in, in a library you can think of. And you see it's just a typical store. We have some event uh, handling functions. We have a getter. We have we register ourselves with a dispatcher, callback, we handle two actions. So it's your typical store. So now you're gonna get to witness uh, every, what everyone loves to do is to hit the crap out of the delete key. So this is gonna be fun. So let's let's see how this works. Uh, problem number one was the store has both data and functions and the functions that act on the data together. So we are going to take our state out of here. Something's gonna give us state. We're gonna have we're not gonna have state in the store. So we don't need the getter for this state. Uh, and so what we're gonna say is we need something to pass us the state. And by the way, this is written in ECMAScript 2015 or ES6, whatever you're more familiar with. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go through the little bits where I use it here and there if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so something's gonna give us this state, uh, and if it's undefined, we want to initialize it to an initial value. So this is how you do that in ES6. You could just do if not state, state equals empty curly break or empty brackets. Uh, so that's a cool little shortcut. Uh, what else do we have in here? We have a lot of event crap for lack of a better word, so don't like it, get rid of it. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we are registering ourselves. oh yeah, we got more event stuff in here, so let's get rid of that. This will be a nice time to have a mouse. Let's so get rid of that event. Uh, we are registering ourselves with a dispatcher. Uh, it's dumb, so let's just cut that out. Uh, export default in ES5 is module.exports equals some function. That, that's all that is. So let's get rid of that. We're just going to export that, that function directly. Uh, this is an arrow function. It's, it's shorthand syntax for an anonymous function, but the this is the this of its parent. It doesn't have a unique this inside of it, so another ES6 cool thing there. Uh, get rid of the dispatcher. We don't. This is all junk we don't need. Uh, what else? Assign event. Yeah, don't need that. Okay, so this is this is fun, right? So we've truncated it down to this point. Uh, what else? We have mutable state still because we're still pushing onto the argument that we're passing, and that's just a bad pattern in general anyway. Uh, and so pick your favorite cloning library. Uh, mm -hmm. My favorite is Lodash. Uh, this is the equivalent of var underscore equals require lodash for those who aren't ES6 friendly here. Uh, okay, so here I am mutating the state. I don't want to do that. I'm going to say I'm going to create some new state uh, by cloning, by doing a deep clone on the state that was given to me. And I want to push onto that and just bear with me for a minute because this won't make sense immediately, but then I want to return new state instead of breaking. The gravity is affecting my mouse again, I apologize. <laughs> All right, and I want to do that in the other case as well. So let's a new state, clone deep state. Let's mutate the cloned version instead of the other version. And we're going to return new state instead of breaking. And at the very end, we return state. All right, so why did I do all that? Well, whatever is calling this the store, or what used to be called the store at this point, uh, it's going to pass us the state. And so the question might be, well, we removed all these you know, event handers, event emitters. How are the views ever going to know that something has changed? Well, whatever is calling this function is giving us a state. Because we're returning either the original state or a different state, we can just use reference equality to say, are these the same things, yes or no? If they're different, it's time to notify our views. If they're the same, nothing to do, we'll just continue on. So that's why we did that. Uh, and we see, you know, let me zoom back out. I know you can't read this anymore, but this is a very small file now, so it's much easier on the, the eyes. Uh, and actually what that function signature is, uh, it's, it's the signature of a reducer. And so that's where Redux comes into play. Uh, I should go forward. Redux are reducers plus flex. And that's not the entire story. Uh, there's also some other subtle changes that we'll get into, but that's the really big one. So the picture changes a little bit. Uh, you see that the dispatcher is completely gone. We have a single store. 
Uh, the store uh, is what you call dispatch on. And actually, it'd be easier just to walk through an example here. So uh, we have our layer of controller views, and to the right of that, we have all of our other, it's called dumb views and redux. It's basically anything, uh, any component that is completely ignorant to Redux. It doesn't know anything about Redux, so it's a very good layer of isolation there. Let's say on that red box, uh, you submit uh, a new message. Uh, it'll ask the action creator to create an action, hence the name, but the action creator does not send that to the store. It sends it back to the controller view for the controller view to dispatch. And so you see an action is comes back here. It's probably hard to see, so I'll zoom in a little bit here. Uh, the controller view will dispatch that action. It'll call the reducer saying, here's my current state, here's the action, give me back a new state or not. If it is a new state, it will call the callbacks on all the controller views. And uh, any components that cared about that part of the state will re-render. So that's how that subtly changes. And you see, like I said earlier, the controller view layer insulates all the, 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 the components to the right from Redux. So all the arrows going to Redux land are at the controller view layer and not any deeper than that. So you may be wondering, okay, how does that work with that, the left side of the, the mm -hmm. diagram there? I don't see the action creator talking to the services or the endpoints. Uh, that's another unique thing with Redux. Uh, so at the top, so this is an action creator, and at the top there, you see that's just a, a typical action. Let's see if we can be careful here. Uh, it's a typical action that just returns, or it's a typical method that just returns an action with a type and a payload. Uh, the one underneath of that is what is called a, a thunk. A thunk is a type of middleware, type of middleware, and that's middleware in the sense of if you've ever used Express, uh, middleware is used in that that uh, technology set as well. Um, basically, instead of returning an action, we return a function. Uh, and with that function, we expect that function to be invoked with a reference to a dispatch function and a get state function. So this is it may get a little bit confusing, but uh, I'll, walk I'll walk through an example here. Um, so when that function is executed, we call dispatch, give it uh, a type, or sorry, give it an action, and that will optimistically create a, a message within the application. And then we call our API layer, say create message on the API layer. It returns a promise. When that promise resolves successfully, we dispatch another action saying it was created successfully. I don't want to exit out of there. So let's look at what that looks like. Uh, again, same example. Some component says, I'm going to create a message. This time, is what comes back is a function. And so we dispatch that function. The store invokes that function, and because the store has a reference to dispatch and get state, it passes, it passes the references to both of those functions so that the other function uh, can invoke those. Again, we ask our reducers to reduce the state. We tell our views it's time to re-render, and they re-render. Then, as the function continues ex executing, it says, API layer, here's the message I want you to create. Return a promise. If it resolves successfully, I want you to dispatch another action. And again, we go through the same cycle here, and we ultimately re-render. And so there's some debate on whether Redux is actually Flux. If, is it an implementation? Is it an implementation detail? Or is it something entirely different? Uh, some of the main points here are there's still unidirectional data flow. Data is still going in one direction. Uh, it's arguably a little bit more confusing, but uh, I'll show you a quick benefit uh, through an example here. There's something called Redux DevTools that's going to demonstrate all of those, I guess the four bullet points that I <coughs> just showed you earlier. So let me fire that up. Okay, so here is a, uh oh, there we go. Here's another to-do app, uh, application. Um, and you'll notice something on the right side there, so keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm gonna create a to-do, finish presentation. And you see, okay, it recorded that to do, so, so that's neat. Uh, what actually happened there is it intercepted the action, recorded it, and it put it in its own little store for it to, for it to display. Uh, so eye contact. All right. And there. Oh, yeah. Hands. Or are we just asking me because you can't see this? Yeah. So, and, uh, we're not gonna hang so you can see on the right side here, uh, all the, the actions are being recorded. Uh, 
So that's cool. That was the the, the cross cutting concerns part of it. What about time travel or undo? Well, let's undo the delete. You see, it's crossed out there. And enhance was added back in. Uh, I don't want to edit anymore. I don't want to mark that to do as finished anymore. Me. Uh, I do want to add that other to do and delete it for whatever reason. So, so that's neat, right? Uh, and in each one of these, I can in inspect the current state. Uh, I could. Not good. Hang on. Inspect. Enhance. No, that one worked. I don't know why the other one didn't. There we go. So that's a cool little developer tool. Uh, what about hot reloading? So this will be fun. Let's close that up. Nah. Go to my to do MDC. So as I said, the issue was you couldn't replace the store without losing your data. Uh, you'll notice we definitely have data in our application. And I want to troubleshoot something. I'm going to say, uh, what does this look like if I uppercased everything when I added it? Oh, that's in the add to do action handle. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it, it live reloads. That's, that's really cool, right? Um, let's see. I'm troubleshooting my delete. So here I'm canceling it and enhance all of this <coughs> back. Okay, so I'm troubleshooting delete, so I just don't want delete to be a thing right now. I'm going to no op it. Save that. Go back. Enhance. It comes back because I disabled it and it, it, it replayed or re rendered the state without losing my actual state. So. Uh, that's super useful. So uh, to me, that really makes up for the, it makes some extra complications, which, okay, it takes a little bit extra time to, to learn it and understand it, but it really increases developer productivity. So I think that's really neat. Uh, another cool feature uh, with this tool specifically has debug sessions. So I'm going to go back to 10 now. Ooh, there's my other data. Back to 11. There's test. So. That's really cool, right? I hope I'm not the only one that thinks that's neat. So, all right. Skip ahead. Okay, so I want to make sure there's time for questions uh, because there is a lot to cover. Uh, there is a lot we didn't cover, though, uh, and there is a lot that you should read up on if you plan on using either Flux or Redux. Uh, the Flux implementation you saw was, again, Flux is both, it's a design pattern but there's also implementations of Flux. Uh, the impl implementation you saw was created by Facebook, uh, and you may be wondering around this point, what implementation? Uh, it was basically the dispatcher. Uh, whenever you saw the dispatcher.register some callback, that was uh, the Flux implementation. Whenever you saw the action creator call dispatcher.dispatch, .dispatch, that was using that Flux's implementation of dispatch. 11 impl other implementations, all Flumex, Reflux, uh, Eight more that I'm not remembering. So, uh, if you want to use Flux, uh, you might want to do your homework on other implementations that may make certain details a little bit easier. Reducer composition. This is something I actually didn't talk about very well in, in the Redux portion, but in Redux, as I said, there's one store. So, what that means is there's one gigantic application state. You don't have separate independent partition states, you have one big application state. And so, you don't want one gigantic reducer to reduce that state. You want to be able to delegate that. I want this reducer to handle users, this one messages, this one threads, and all the other domains. Um, and so reducer composition allows you to effectively create one giant reducer by supplying it several small ones. Uh, Redux application state, so that's an interesting architectural discussion, uh, especially if you, your, the data you're dealing with is relational in any way. Uh, how do you design that tree structure of your application state? Uh, if you're serious about looking into Redux, look into norm normalizing your data, um, and you'll quickly find some advice on that when you just Google a Redux application state. And then I swear I'm not some kind of you know Facebook fanboy, but they're really cranking out some really cool things recently. They've got React, they've got Flux, GraphQL, Relay, React Native, and, and other things. And so I'm not going to actually explain what those are, just kind of a, as a cliffhanger. But those are three things to keep on your radar especially within the next year, because at least one of them is, is going to be a big deal, in my opinion. Uh, so look at what those are, try and understand, and they, they all have a, you know, get started, learn it in five minutes page. Understand the problems they're trying to solve, because they, it's really neat. So I'll cut myself off there, because I'll go on for until like 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, and so if you didn't write anything down, uh, one thing to write down if you're interested in this material is that first link. 
Uh, I put my present presentation up on GitHub. If that's hard to read. Charlie, could you post those on the Meetup page? Yes, I'll put it in the comments section. Thank you. Um, but just to read it out loud, it's at GitHub Ccoster22 slash Flex Redux presentation. Uh, I will post it tonight or tomorrow whenever I remember to do it. If not, Sandy will I'll yell at me. Yeah, she will, <laughs> she will harass me. Um, and on this page you'll find several links that really help me understand what Flux and Redux were, the problems they're trying to solve, the examples uh, that help me kind of you know, figure this out. Um, so just go, go check it out because it's really neat. Uh, and with that, I'll open up for any questions. Yeah. Uh, when you were kind of talking solely about Flux before you got to Redux, and you were talking about the act, action creator, um, this goes to dis dispatch, and then dispatch, you dispatch all the actions to all the different stores, mm -hmm. and then the stores reject the actions that aren't necessary. Can you explain that a little more? Sure. So. Just to kind of back up one more step, the dispatcher knows about all the stores because the stores register themselves with it. And so when the dispatcher receives a single action, the dispatcher will call the callback of every store with that single action. Uh, and when I say those stores rejected it, I mean, they actually just don't do anything. They just don't handle it in their switch statement. It just, it just falls right through. Um, and so, and that's basically it, is when the callback is invoked, it receives an action, there's no case statement for that action, and so therefore, no state gets mutated in there, and no action gets fired, or no em uh, event gets emitted. Got it. Good question. Other questions? Mike? Do you have a preferred uh, immutable, I, I saw there is some ES7 syntax there, um, in terms of Going through Redux, is there like a, a recommended or one that works really well in terms of an immutable library for, for building your state and, and cloning it performantly? Uh, on the side, I'm starting to look into immutable JS. Uh, I haven't I haven't used it enough to be able to recommend it. I do know that a lot of the examples you'll find out just by Googling uh, will use immutable JS. So I know it's not terrible, at least. Uh, but I don't know if I could recommend it. Um, but in the example you saw, I was just using Lodash clone deep, uh, assuming this wasn't like a, a performant critical application, or I'm not dealing with a very very large you know structure. Uh, that probably is sufficient for a lot of you know medium to small use cases. If you're looking at, again, I said I want to you know recommend immutable JS just because I don't use it, but from what I've read about it, it's really good at very large data sets. <coughs> so that's what I recommend there. Uh, just a question for the crowd. Is anyone using Flux or Redux currently? That's neat. How do you like it? Okay, one good. thumb up. Yeah. One thumb way up. Yeah. That's, that's good. Very, very good. Oh, good. See, that was better than that. You like it? Okay. And was it Flux or Redux? Redux. Redux? Ooh, nice. It's immutable. Mutable JS? Mutable JS. And is it working well for you? Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, I'm coming from the functional side. Okay. So it's, much, it's more natural for me to think in terms of functions and immutable data. So. Gotcha. There you have it, Mike. One recommendation. So. Well, there's there's a ton of tools around the ecosystem too. I mean, yeah, you know, you you pointed out some ES6 stuff and using Babel to compile that down so that that is ES5 and you can run wherever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your last link is really incredible because most people are familiar with awesome science where, where awesome React would have 4,000 links about React and awesome Angular would have four million links about Angular. Awesome Redux, and Redux has been in existence for three, four months now. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's hundreds of links on that page. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing what the, the buzz around that. Right. Right. And that's actually a good point. Redux is on version <coughs> 4.0 using Simver, uh, and it is four months old. And so, yeah, so it's uh, questionable whether it's it's stable right now, um, but any given version is usable, usable and useful. So it's, it's just something to keep in mind if you're thinking about using it in production. Uh, and they're still kind of settling on uh, breaking changes and kind of the inner workings of Redux. Question: mm -hmm. What do you think about using Redux with React Native? With React Native, mm -hmm. 
I am less familiar with React Native. I know I put it up there uh, because I'm excited about, you know, so there's some talk on it that got me hyped up. So I'm like, woo, you know, right? And, uh, so I don't know, but I do know that like Flux, Redux is, it, it can be framework agnostic. It doesn't really care whether you're using Angular under the, under the hood or not. Um, and so there's nothing, there's nothing telling me that says don't use it, you know, no big red warning signs there. So uh, if it were up to me, I would definitely look into it to begin with. All right, no other questions. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight.